Hello, everyone, and welcome to Mole Hill Mountain, episode 117. Andrew Eisen here, and that's all it's going to be here tonight. Uh, Zachary is away doing stuff. So, solo show. Um, how y'all? So, uh, I tried uh, Mega Man 11 again, the demo, and I just suck too badly at it. I, I seriously cannot beat the one stage. Granted, I'm not trying very hard because I get to the same spot and I get annoyed at the way Mega Man gets caught on corners when you try to jump. And then I say, eh, screw it, and I stop playing. So I, I guess I'm not giving it a terribly fair chance because I'm just kind of annoyed with that uh, aspect. But other than that, it seems fine. Seems all right. Um, I think the design is okay. I, I, I'm old, so I'm, I'm kind of used to the old aesthetic, but uh, it, it looks nice, I suppose. Um, uh, Mega Man moves way too slow on the ladders, though. Uh, other than that, everything seems fine. And he gets caught on corners when he jumps, which, which really hurts uh, a portion in the middle of the stage, I think just past the, min the mid-boss. Uh, there's these, uh, these walls that are moving towards you and a bunch of blades on the other side of the screen. And you have to shoot your way, you have to shoot a specific path through the wall so you don't get slammed against the far side. And uh, every time I jump up to get up onto a ledge, Mega Man just catches a corner and I get stuck. Uh, you heard there are upgrades in the main game for those issues? Great. Doesn't do me any good in the demo, but... <laughs> um, yeah, uh, if it's anything like more recent uh, games, there are upgrades for all kinds of things. Uh, not instant death when you hit spikes, uh, being able to... Uh, more power to your buster, less knockback, you know, things like that. Um, other than that, the, con the control's tight, the enemy design is fine, the level layout's fine, it's uh, it's just fine. Did I get Super Mario Party? Oh, hell no. I've, and I, that's derisive, I understand, but I, I have never cared for Mario Party. But I'm, I'm not a multiplayer gamer, so that's probably mostly why. Uh, even the good versions of Mario Party, I just don't care about. I'm the guy who genuinely, who is genuinely bored to tears playing things like Super Mario Kart. I don't like those games at all. They bore the hell out of it. They, they genuinely bore me. I'm not saying they're bad games. They're just not for me. So yeah, Super Mario Party, absolutely no interest in. So what is the worst game I've ever played? Asks Eva Lurks. Um... Geez, that's a good question. Uh, it's it's kind of like asking, what's the worst movie you've ever seen? Well, I've seen some crap, some film student crap. So uh, hard question to answer because you try to think of just the most utterly broken, incompetent uh, indie schlock that was just on someone's personal Geo Cities page or something. But I don't think that's what you're asking. Usually that question is, what is the worst mainstream-ish game that you've played? Um, that's a tough one because in modern day, rarely do you ever... There's so much information out there that it's very unlikely that you're going to end up with a game that's a complete dud because there's just there's impressions and video and reviews. It is not, you may end up with a game that everyone loves and it's just not for you. And that's happened to me before. One that comes to mind is Metal Arms, a glitch in the system. Fine game, did not like it at all. Bought it be just on the recommendation of everybody. Uh, everyone loved that game back in the uh, GameCube PS2 Xbox days. I went, well, all right. And I bought it and I played it. And I go, I don't like it. So the shadow over my left shoulder looks like a woman standing behind you. I know it's your stuffed animal display. Yeah, it's uh, it's my stripper pole of stuffed animals. Uh, a lot of people say that shadow looks like Mario holding a tombstone. So 
Um, yeah, most everyone loves Metal Arms glitch in the system. Just never clicked for me. I don't know why. Um, not a bad game, though. Just just didn't like it. Let me see. So any game I mention as, oh, this game just sucks, is probably going to be a much older game. Because back then, you just all you had was the box art, <laughs> you know, there, there was no internet. Uh, in the very late eighties, you started to get, you know, gamer magazines, which maybe had a subscription to Nintendo power, which I did. Maybe you'd leaf through game pro or whatever in the supermarket, which I did. Um, two come to mind. Uh, one is a uh, clay fighter, I think the N64 one, 63 and third, they called it or something like that. Um, because I remember reading about it in um, Nintendo Power Magazine, and it just sounded like a really goofy, fun time. And I, I had played the Clay Fighter game on Super NES and thought it was okay. I'm not a huge fighting fan myself. I like fighters. I just don't really like playing them too much. Um, because once I've seen every move a character can do I'm, I'm like done I have, I have no interest in playing it anymore i'm like i've seen it i'm good it's kind of like racing games once i've driven around the track i'm like oh that's neat I, I have no interest in driving around it again and again and again and again and again um so i rented uh clay fighter uh, just to check it out because uh, my cousin and i had played the one on super nes and uh they had a laugh and it's terrible what was interesting is um, it, it, Nintendo Power lied. Uh, I remember there was one character called Hobo Cop, which is a pretty... <laughs> it's a, there's a name for you. And that character is not even in the game. Um, another one I actually bought based on what I had read in uh, Nintendo Power and other gaming magazines, and they everyone lied about through doctored screenshots and stuff that were completely misrepresentative of the game, was Mission Impossible, which is a bad, 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 bad game. It's kind of worth checking out. Uh, it does have probably one of the funniest jumping animations um, I've seen in any uh, video game. Ethan Hunt's character kind of does this prancing hop similar to how Link jumps in Breath of the Wild. This wee, <laughs> wee. <laughs> so I end up jumping everywhere. Uh, the game, I, it's playable. I, I played it and I beat it, but it was not at all uh, what the uh, Nintendo Power and other magazines were making it out to be. Of course, back then it was a lot easier to lie about your game. You just submit bullpucky screenshots, and the magazines are like, I, "I, this is the media we receive, so this is what we're getting published." So, uh, Earthworm Jim 3D. I bought that pretty much just based on the name. I loved Earthworm Jim. I loved uh, Earthworm Jim 2. And so Earthworm Jim 3. Hey, all right, Earthworm Jim in 3D. And that game is phenomenally bad. It's got some good humor in it. So some of the humor is there, but the game plays like butt. Um, I'm getting some agreement in the chat. So yeah, th those are those are some games that stick out to me as just being really bad. Now I've definitely played worse, but usually when I think of what's the worst game you've ever played or movie you've ever seen, a, a lot of times what I think of is like the most disappointing or something that, or like the degree to which it was worse than I was expecting. Um, I'd say the mo the worst movie I've ever seen, at least in the theater, um, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. That was by far the worst film I have ever seen in the theater. I was stunned at how bad that movie was. Now, I wasn't expecting anything great or phenomenal like the best movie ever, but... Um, yeah, I'd read the source material and it was fun. And I'm like, all right, it's it's got literary hero characters or at least literary known characters teaming up to fight bad guys. It's the Avengers before the Avengers, you know. Uh, but oh my god, it's bad, really, really bad. Um, so there. 
Um, so what shall we talk about today? Uh, I was thinking talk about video games and cartoons because that's what I like. There were a lot of um, trailers this week. And uh, as you may notice from how I've titled this podcast, uh, one of them was the full trailer for the upcoming She-Ra reboot, I, gu I guess you would call it. Um, and uh, I'd been, uh, I, I did a debut review of the original She-Ra uh, cartoon uh, a couple months ago. Uh, never seen it before, so uh, at least I didn't think I had. I, I, I realized going in that I knew so much about it, I must have seen it at some point, or I had absorbed all that from the toys. Um, watch that episode if, if you're curious what I mean, because I, I spend most of the episode just showing off my He-Man and She-Ra action figures that I do actually reviewing the show. And so I end up playing with my toys and going, oh my god, it's broken after the last 35 years. Um... So, new She-Ra show uh, coming to Netflix. Uh, so, they, they released a full trailer, and uh, I was always kind of curious to see what they'd, uh, what direction they'd go with it. Are they just taking the general conceit of She-Ra, a woman who has a magic sword that turns her into a warrior for good and just go their own way or are they going to use the actual setup of the original she-ra show which for those of you who don't who aren't up on your she-ra lore let me explain this to you so in the mystical land of eternia there is the evil horde they are the bad guys if you couldn't tell from the name <laughs> they're so bad that they call themselves the evil horde and they are led by Hordak. Um, so, uh, what is her name? Adora. I almost said Aurora, but that's Sleeping Beauty. Um, Adora is the Force Captain of the Horde. She's a bad guy. Um, but she was stolen as a baby and raised to be a member of the Horde. So, she doesn't know any better. Well, um, uh, interestingly, He-Man gets captured by the Horde. Uh, he, uh, uh, Sorceress sends him to Eternia. Uh, not Eternia. Uh, Etheria. Um, to find She-Ra, his long-lost sister. And a uh, very, very soap opera. Um, and he gets captured, and he's like, you're She-Ra, or you're uh, Adora. And she goes, I'm Force Captain Adora of the Horde, the evil Horde. And he goes... Yeah, did you think about the, the that evil adjective as the part of your name? That's bad, right? Oh, it's just a it's just a name. They workshopped a bunch of things. I'm sure it was the best they could come up with. And he says, "Why don't you just go out into the world and see with your own eyes what the horde is like?" And she goes, "Well, maybe I will." And he goes, "You should." And she goes, "I will." And he goes, "Fine." And she goes, "Fine." So she does. And she finds out that the Horde are, live up to their name. And so she uh, finds the, the sword of power, whatever the sword's name is, and becomes She-Ra and uh, fights with the resistance against the evil Horde. Uh, so I was kind of wondering if the new She-Ra would take that basic premise of you have a kid who grows up with the bad guys and realizes that they're the bad guys and switches sides. All right. Uh, according to the new trailer, yeah, they're they're doing exactly that. Adora grows up with the Horde. She becomes Force Captain. Uh, but they seem to be, and she finds out that they're bad and leaves and joins the Resistance. Uh, but what I found interesting about the trailer is uh, they are going a little bit more in depth with character and relationships and such, it, it seems. For example, Catra, who in the original show was just a woman with a silly hat, uh, kind of like um, Scarlet Witch's headdress thing, uh, who could turn into a panther, because she could. And that way they could sell you two toys. <laughs> you know, the woman and the panther. Um, hello, uh, peoples in the chat. Uh, so, But in the new one, Catra is a cat girl. She still has that weird headgear thing, uh, but she's an actual cat girl instead of just some woman who who turns into a cat. 
interesting choice and they're friends and there's a whole betrayal thing going on when a um when um, Adora leaves the the horde, tries to take Catra with her. It looks like she goes back at some point to try and get Catra, and then Catra like stuns her, and then kidnaps her, and then I the trailer kind of implies that Catra knows that Adora is Shira. Be interesting to see how that plays. Um, the trailer also spoils, I suppose, that uh, the Resistance knows that Adora is Shira. Um, and she does that. She reveal she, as she or she presents herself to the resistance and then transforms back to Adora, which is something we never saw in the original show. There was always the transformation to Shira or to He-Man, but you never saw them transform back. You actually see it in the show, which is kind of neat. And it's just womp, <laughs> just kind of reverts back to uh, Adora. It says, "Yeah," and they're like, "Oh my God, it's a Force Captain of the Horde." And, uh, you know, she prostrates herself in front of the uh, Council of the Resistance and they accept her. And uh, someone has a really funny line. It's like, yeah, you know, she was part of the horde that destroyed half my hometown, but she also turns into an eight foot tall woman with a sword. So I want her on my team. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that's a good reason. Um, Bo, who has a much better design in this show, because Bo has probably the dorkiest design of any character ever. Uh, looks a lot better in this show. The design is a lot better. Um, he has a great line where he's confronting Adora. And he says, they're called the evil horde. She says, who calls us that? And he looks at her like she's an idiot. And he goes, everyone. <laughs> so a lot of the humor, for me at least, was on point. Some of it was a little goofy, but um, for my taste anyway. But a lot of it I, I felt was pretty good. Like a lot of the design, as I mentioned, I like Catra's design. Um Hordak's new design works for me. Uh, oh God, what is her name? Shadow Weaver, I think her name is. Uh, has always been a, had a really cool look. Um, Orko, but tall, slender, and evil. Um, same idea, basic red cloaked dress, but she has her hood back this time, and she's wearing a mask. Uh, normally, she'd have her hood up, and all you'd see are glowing eyes peeking out from the darkened hood. But uh, at least in the scene they show in the trailer. Uh, her hood's back and she has a mask. Not sure how I feel about that, but it works. Uh, voice sounds good. Um, got a glimpse of uh, the winged horse. What 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 the hell's the horse's name? Uh, shoot, I'll think of it. Um, someone tell me what Shira's horse's name is because I forget. Damn it. Um, uh, Glimmer uh, has a, an interesting scene, although it's kind of hard to tell because trailers are chopped up. But it looks like she may have a somewhat of a grudge against Shira. Like Shira got promoted in the Resistance above her, and she may be a little bit indignant of that. So drama, uh, some interesting things there. Um, yeah. So all in all, uh, if I were to be uh, nitpicky. It looks like this show doesn't have the highest budget. Some of the animation, some of the characters are a little off model in a couple of the shots. Uh, eh, you know, not enough to ruin the show, but uh, enough that I noticed. And uh, as, for, oh, uh, She-Ra's new design. Um, I like the original She-Ra's headdress better, but other than that, she looks cool, so... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to checking this out. Based on the trailer, I would say that this show has a lot of potential. Even for a show that's probably not exactly targeting me. But uh, yeah, I think it comes out in mid-November. So uh, yeah, I'll probably uh, do a debut review of it and uh, see how it turns out. Looks like it could be cool. Um, damn it, what is that horse's name? Um Oh, also, they have uh, the, the subtitle shows Princesses of Power, and they show off a bunch of the other princesses. And the only name I've ever remembered is Castaspella because her name is Castaspella. Guess what she does? Uh, but there were all kinds of different princesses in the Shira line, and they were just they were the exact same doll, just with different hair and clothes. It's it's nice to see that. Um, the way they're doing the designs in this show, they are very distinct. So I'm actually really looking forward to seeing what the toys look like because that's not easy because, you know, 
Glimmer's body type is completely different from She-Ra's. And if they do a She-Ra and an Adora doll, they may have to make two different dolls just due to the physical stature of each character. You know, in the, uh, the old He-Man and She-Ra line, they could use the same doll, uh, just change its clothes out, and it was fine. Uh, but this show actually has different, uh, a lot of different uh, looks and shapes and body types. So um, feel sorry for the toy manufacturers, but it, it does make for a much more interesting looking show. Uh, and you've, so some of the princesses, one is basically Poison Ivy, one is a mermaid, one is, a, is Elsa from Frozen. So could be cool. Could be cool. I'm looking forward to seeing this. Uh, Tartooth says, uh, do you think there will ever be a time in your life when you no longer have the capacity to care about video games? Uh, goes on to say, I'm beginning to feel lethargic about games. Maybe I'm burned out from years of playing games and consuming gaming related content on a daily basis. It's a bummer because it used to be a huge passion. Um, do I think there will ever be a time when I no longer have the capacity to care about video games? I suppose. Um, could happen. I hope not because I like caring about and enjoying things. Um, I have to admit I'm not as enthused about Nintendo these days as I have been in all years previous. Uh, but that's just because the switch isn't targeted at me. Uh, but I, I'm enjoying the PlayStation 4, <laughs> so, um, so uh, I hope not. Uh, but I mean, it's possible. I, I, in some ways, lost my passion for music a few years ago. Um, or it's not so much I lost my passion for music as I just got tired of not getting out what I was putting into it because uh, the, the type of music I'm into is a uh, uh, barbershop, uh, acapella music that requires other people and people have the capacity to let you down and you have no control over that. And I just got tired of dealing with people letting me down and it got to the point where dealing with, and working around people who were, un and that's not everyone, of course, but there were enough people who were unreliable that working around them to do what I wanted to do just was outweighing how much fun it was to perform music. And so I stopped uh, years ago and haven't done it since. I, I still sing in my spare time, uh, like around the house, or and I still plunk away at my keyboard and play things and uh i still enjoy music i don't perform it anymore i just uh so i guess the to shorten that answer as far as video games go i imagine there could be some external force that might override my enthusiasm for gaming i may for example if um if Nintendo and everyone else goes the way of EA and Ubisoft and Activision with just microtransactioning the crap out of everything, that that would push me out of gaming. Like if, um, it, what's a recent example? What just came out? Uh, uh, Jesus, Assassin's Creed Odyssey just came out fine game in and of itself but ubisoft deliberately broke it in order to sell you more crap you know microtransactions and I mean, there, there's there's dlc there's tiers of dlc there's like six or seven different versions of the game out there there's no single version you can buy that gets you all the stuff um when you play the i've read i think like two articles where Someone has said it's going to cost you an extra 10 bucks to get the good stuff in this game. I, I didn't actually read the article, but that was the headline and lead. Apparently, in order to make the game enjoyable, you need to spend an extra 10 bucks on some DLC something. Um, 
companies make want you to buy their microtransactions and they will rebalance the game so that it's so that you want to buy microtransactions which is why when they remove stuff like that from the game like in star wars battlefront and uh shadows of mordor or whatever it's called um you would uh they have to rebalance the game because they broke the game deliberately in order to get more money out of you so if that become that could become so pervasive that it would just push me out of gaming because as many of you know i already if if a game is coming out and the company starts trying to sell dlc for a game that isn't even out yet you know separate paid dlc i won't buy it I'm like, uh, Spider-Man, uh, the, the new Tomb Raider, Valkyrie Chronicles 4, uh, all these games, I'm not buying. I may buy them a year or two later when they release a Game of the Year edition that has all the stuff in it, but that will make me not buy games. And if that happens enough, if enough of that crap become, uh, gets into games, that may push me mostly out of it. So to an- so that incredibly long answer to a pretty simple yes or no question is, it's possible, yeah, but I certainly hope not. Um, Matthew asks, have I started uh, Near Automata? Uh, no. Uh, I actually have not fin- uh, started Fist of the North Star yet either. Uh, I've been working on a uh, video series uh, uh, for YouTube called Bad Breath of the Wild, which is just me complaining about all the things in Zelda Breath of the Wild that I don't like. And it's taking a long, long time because there are a lot of things in Zelda that I don't like. <laughs> um, in fact, I, I was working on it right before we started the, uh, right before I started this podcast. Um, one of the things I'm, I'm probably putting way too much work into this than I really need to. I, I don't need, I, sh- it's like, why am I spending the time to actually specifically script this and capture footage? Because if I do that, Nintendo's going to notice and block the whole thing anyway. Um, I could just sit in front of a camera for half an hour and rant about it, like I've I've done on podcasts past. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to organize my thoughts in a digestible and entertaining manner. Uh, you know, it, it's not just a complete pardon the language but bitch fest uh i i try to make it a you know an entertaining critique of where i feel the game doesn't do as well as it could um so i'm hoping to finish the scripting this weekend looks like it's going to be seven videos i might bust one up into two parts because it's a little long but so maybe eight but probably seven videos um we'll see uh, those, so if I finish the script this weekend and I film them next weekend and then another week to edit, uh, probably the end of the month, uh, would, would be when I start releasing those, uh, which I, I really want to get them out before the, uh, uh, extra life charity event, because that's kind of the point, you know, I, I played breath of the wild or er, way earlier this year, uh, had some issues with it and stopped playing it. Uh, here's what I didn't like. Now I'm going to spend 24 hours playing the game and make myself like it because I don't like not liking Zelda because I like Zelda. Plus, it was a birthday present from my sister, and I feel really bad about not liking the game. <laughs> Actually, that's not true. I don't dislike it. I just find it difficult to work up the enthusiasm to start playing. Because every time I think about playing Zelda, I think about all the annoyances, and I'm like, eh, do I really want to put up with that right now? But once I start the game, I'm fine. And in fact, I've been capturing footage uh, to use in my videos, and I'll find myself just kind of putzing around in the game. Once I start playing the game, I'm fine. So I'm not thinking that the the charity event is going to be a slog of 24, 25 hours. It's going to be fun. Um, once I start the game, I'm usually fine. Um, let's see. Uh, Tartu said, uh, sorry to hear about the music thing. Love your singing voice. Hope you're able to find an avenue for pursuing music again. Thanks. Uh, you, you know, I'll, I'll be honest. This, this may sound petty and it may be petty, but, uh, 
one of the things that has kept me away from music is I have trouble trusting that people are good people. To expand on that a little bit, I am fearful that I will find out that the people I work with are just genuinely terrible people because that has happened. I work with someone, uh, develop a rapport for them, or I have a, uh, a peer who I very much respect and admire or a role model. And then you find out who and what they really are. And that's kind of soul crushing. So I'll admit, I can be a bit gun shy about new people or even people I know. I don't like getting too close to people because I'm afraid of what I might learn. And that probably sounds really, really petty and paranoid and silly. And perhaps it is, but that's where I am. But uh, yeah, I hope so too, because I, I genuinely do enjoy music. It's one of the, it's one of the things I, I do truly enjoy. And uh, I would like to do it again. Uh, one of the most fun things in the world for me is barbershop quartet singing and competing. Um, and if I could find three other guys to sing with who were reliable, that would be great. But uh, every attempt I've made over 20 years has fallen apart. Now, some have lasted longer than others. I mean, I've had some that last several years, but they always just fall apart, and I'm just tired of it now. And I don't... The disappointment of it ending, at least at this point in my life, is overriding the enjoyment of while it lasts, if you understand, if I'm communicating that well enough. Uh, let's see... Uh, uh, Matthew says won't happen. There will all be always be CD Projekt Red and Indies. Uh, I think you're referring to uh, microtransactions and other bunk like that won't completely take over video games. I, yeah, I certainly hope not. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Uh, Tartooth says, as a huge Zelda fan, Breath of the Wild is a dream come true. I couldn't put it down. Glad to hear it. Glad to hear it. Um, it's a great game. Uh, it's just, it has a few, for me anyway, barriers to entry. <laughs> I'd say really one of the most pervasive sticking issues for me with that game is just how damn slow Link is. He is so slow. Moving around the... it. it and it, it's not always a problem because when you're just, um, and I'm talking about his just land speed, but well, I mean, he's also incredibly slow swimmer and incredibly slow climber. I have the climbing bandana and that, um, that makes you climb faster, but it increases your speed from very slow to just plain old slow. <laughs> so, um, when uh, in the game, when I'm uh, just poking around and you know chasing squirrels and climbing trees and throwing rocks at bokoblins' heads, it's fine. But it's when you decide to go somewhere, when you say, "Ah, that thing in the distance there, I want to go there," and you push the control stick and Link starts jogging, and you're like, "Oh God, come on, go faster!" And so you you whistle for your horse, and it goes, "Your horse can't hear you." Because you're more than 50 feet away. Uh, you know, it's like, oh my god. Um, and your weapons break all the time. And the Korok puzzles repeat over and over and over. Like, you know the, the geoglyph puzzle? Where you see a uh, pattern of rocks on the ground. And one of the rocks is missing. And you find the rock and you put it and you complete the pattern and a Korok pops up. First time you see it, it's really cool. Second time, not so much. And even less the third time. And the fourth, and the fifth, and the sixth, and the seventh, and the eighth. I've put maybe 15 to 20 hours in the game. I have 55 Korok seeds. I've seen that same puzzle. Uh, eight times. 
And I've only explored three of the major areas of the game. I'm not sure how many major areas there are. I'm guessing like maybe a dozen. Um, so unless there's unless I'm just really unlucky and all the geoglyph puzzles happen to be in the same area, which is really bad placement, uh, seriously, at least three of them are around Mount Lanaru, however that is pronounced. Um... I actually pulled up a, uh, a FAQ and I counted. There are, of the 900, 900 uh, Koroks, 62 of them are those geoglyph puzzles. 62! There's really only, um, it depends on how you count, but I, I mean, most of them are hidden under a rock. Sometimes the rock itself is under something else. Would you consider that a separate puzzle? Would you consider under a rock, under a rock that's under a pile of leaves, two separate puzzles? You might, in which case you could probably say there's maybe 20 or so different ways that the Koroks are hidden. Or you could say there's about 12. I think Nintendo could have come up with a few more puzzles because, I mean, the world is so big that you probably want to repeat the puzzles a bit just to make sure that everyone gets a chance to see all the puzzle types. That's fine. And the puzzle types usually have enough variation between them, like the, um, like the block puzzle simple puzzle it's like there's a stack of blocks here there's a stack of blocks here move the single block to the other stack to match the stacks and yay puzzle complete and there's different orientations of block stacks so the the it's the same puzzle but the specifics are a little bit different each time you know that every time you see a circle of lily pads there's going to be a korok hidden there 35 in total if my counting is accurate but Sometimes you need to be creative in how you cannonball into the lily pad. Sometimes you have to climb a nearby mountain and paraglide down. That said, I don't think you should see the same puzzle several dozen times. I, I've seen, I think, 35 of the 120 shrines. And with very few exceptions, they're complete, u completely unique. Which tells me that the 120 shrines, unless I've just really lucked out so far, are almost all completely unique. Which tells me that Nintendo probably could have come up with a couple different environmental puzzles <laughs> with which to hide Koroks. Which isn't, again, I want to be clear, it's not to say the puzzles are bad. They're not. They're good. They're, they're charming. They're great. They're delightful the first time you see them. Just... Just, just not so much the subsequent times. Because you lose that sense of discovery. You know? When you first see the uh, Jizo statues, and you notice that one of the offering plates is empty. And so you see apples in the other offering plates, and you think, I have an apple. And you put an apple in the empty uh, offering plate. And poof, Korok, yay, you found me. Oh, that's charming as hell. But then you see the exact same puzzle again, and 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 again. I think there's 25 Jizo statue puzzles in the game. Um, I love th that the game rewards your your curiosity. You know, you're exploring and you see something interesting and you go poke it with a stick. And aha, you clever boy or clever girl, you have found me. Ah, I pat myself on the back. I feel good about that. Then you you drive your horse down the road and you see the same setup. And you're like, oh, that's there's a Korok over there. I can tell because it's the exact same puzzle. Guess I'll get off my horse, walk over there and do that real quick. Ah, yep, it's a Korok. You know, you, you lose that sense of um, exploration and wonder. Uh, so, and it's a shame. It's a shame. I, I think you could have had more of that in the game if Nintendo had come up with more puzzles. They delayed the game enough. They had the time. 
<laughs> so max out your stamina and it becomes less of an, an issue. Yes, you are right. But that takes hours and hours and hours hours of play to get your stamina to a point that I feel is adequate for where Link should start. When he starts the game, his stamina wheel when running lasts for about four seconds. Four. Now, to increase the stamina wheel by a fraction of a second, you have to spend four spirit orbs which you get by completing shrines. So to get your stamina wheel to what I would consider the bare minimum acceptable amount would be, I'd say, five stamina upgrades. So 20 shrines. And that's if you don't, up, that's if you don't upgrade your hearts at all, because hearts are upgraded the same way. So you may have your stamina exactly where you want it, but your hearts are still at three. Granted, there's a bunch of uh, meals and stuff you can cook to expand that out, so you could do that. But yeah, it takes hours and hours and hours before you finally get linked to where I feel he should have started at. Now, could I do better? Like me personally, C could I sprint longer? Than yes, I could. I can actually sprint longer than four seconds. Um so it's that doesn't seem to bother most gamers, which is fine, but it bugs the hell out of me. Uh, let's see. What do I think of the Harry Potter game leak that happened this week? I know nothing about it, so I have no thoughts on it. Uh, let's see. There's the ancient saddle, which allows you to summon your horse from forever away. That sounds amazing. I did not know about that. I look forward to getting that someday because your horse can't hear you from very far away. It makes it really stupid. The other thing, and I have a whole video on the horse, on calling the horse. There are two things that I can't stand. One, if you get too far away, which is like, if you run in one direction for one minute and then you whistle, your horse will not be able to hear you. You are too far. However, if you run in one direction for 50 seconds and you whistle, your horse can hear you. But it's going to take your horse about 50 seconds to get to you. If your horse decides to run at you in a straight line, sometimes, often actually, your horse just kind of goes off to the side for reasons. And has taken up to 85 seconds to reach me. See, when I whistle for my horse, I want my horse now. Not a minute and a half from now. So usually when I whistle for my horse, I end up running towards my horse to meet it halfway. And which means I'm usually running away from the direction I wanted to go. So I'm doubling back and then retracing my steps again. It's a waste of time. Granted, it's you know a waste of a minute but that's my minute. I'm getting old. I'm closer to death. Those minutes are precious to me. Um, I, I really wish it, it just worked like it worked in uh, Twilight Princess and Ocarina of Time when you whistled for your horse or played the ocarina or whatever and your horse just ran up behind you like it had been stalking you from the tree line. Works just fine. Um, Laneru is how it's pronounced. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I guess um, I, I'm. Yeah, that's that's got to be it. Chaos. Thank you, because uh, I look at it as la na. I'm trying to put y r u into the same syllable, and it just doesn't work. I keep going lana u. <laughs> so yeah, la neru, la neru. Okay. Um, don't worry, Andrew, there's 900 Korok seeds. You haven't even seen a small fraction of those puzzles. No, I've seen all of them. I looked. There's really only a dozen or so different puzzle types. Uh, there's, th there's the sparkles, which you can find in the top of trees or the top of, like, th there's one on the top of the spire and the uh, uh, Temple of Time, little sparkles, and you go examine them and poof, Korok. 
Uh, there's other sparkles that move. Would you consider those two different puzzle types? You might. There's the uh, pinwheel archery thing uh, where balloons are in the air and you shoot them with your arrow. But there's the pinwheel archery gallery where they're firing acorns or nuts or some sort. I would consider that the same puzzle, but you might consider those different puzzles. I've seen all the puzzles because I looked in a strategy guide to see what the different puzzle types were. And yeah, that's it. There, there's really only 12 to 15 puzzle types. I mean, you, you could get that up to maybe 22 to 24. I mean, I consider under a rock to be one puzzle type, and that's the most common one. But you could break that out into under a rock, under a rock that's in the bow of a tree, under a rock that's under a rock, under a rock that's under a metal slab, under a rock that's under a door, under a rock that's under a pile of leaves, under a rock that's behind a bombable wall. That's seven completely different puzzles, right? Eh, you could count them that way. I don't. I consider that the under a rock puzzle. And I never really understood that either. It's like, why is it under, why is the Korok under a rock under a rock? Just put it under a rock. Why is it under a rock that's under a pile of leaves? Just burn away the leaves and Korok. Why is it under a rock that's under a big metal door? Just move the metal door. Oh, Korok. I, that's not really a problem. I just find it weird. I, it's unnecessary. So, um, yeah. They're, the puzzle Again, the puzzles are good. I like the puzzles. I think a lot of them are incredibly charming and clever. They, there's just not enough of them. Oh, well. Uh, let's see. What, what's going on in the chat here? Uh, Chaos was watching a Metallica concert. Okay. Uh, don't try to do everything in an area all at once. Feel free to wander and explore. Yeah, sure. Uh, Laxter says, Koroks don't seem that creative to me. Even if they doubled the total number of puzzle types, though, with 900 total, they still be repeated probably eight times. You know, with 900, I'd think, you know, you could get away with up to 10 repeats. But, um... If my initial count is correct, the geoglyph puzzle, 62. 62. 62 times. <laughs> That's way too many repeats. Now, granted, that seems to be like really on the high side because I counted the, uh, the Jizo statues, and there seems to be only 25 of those, which is still way more than there should be. Um, the lily pads, I think there are 35. The, the circle of lily pads, 35. It's just, yeah. They, they really just needed to come up with a bunch more puzzle types. Again, it doesn't, doesn't ruin the game. It just, you, you know, the 57th time you've seen, literally the 57th time you've seen a geoglyph puzzle, it's not exciting. It's kind of a chore now. It's like, oh, uh, one of those again. All right, let's see. Where's the rock? Uh, there it is. Let's slowly lug the rock because everything in this game is so damn slow. Poomp. Yep, Korok, give me your seed. Give me the seed, Korok. All right. Now, as far as I know, uh, you can ma the, the Korok seeds uh, expand your uh, equipment inventory size um, so you can carry more swords, which is nice because they keep breaking. Um, from what I've read, and I don't know if this is true, feel free to tell me in the comments, uh, you only need to gather about, you, you max out your equipment satchel once you've collected about half of the Korok seeds. So, uh, that's, I think that's a fair idea. You, you don't need to collect all 900 of them. You can max everything out by finding half of them. I think that's fair. And I think and I think it's fair that there are repeats. I, I don't expect Nintendo to come up with 900 completely unique uh, environmental puzzles with which to hide the Koroks. I mean, that would be ideal, I suppose, but I don't expect them to do that. But I do expect them to come up with... I mean, at least 50, right? 
I mean, even e even even then, you still have eighteen repeats. But man, at least fifty unique ways, right? I mean, there's one hundred and twenty shrines. Maybe they just completely just ran out of ideas. I don't know. But I mean, again, the puzzle types do have variations within them. Like I mentioned, the uh, the lily pads. I mean, it's always cannonball into the center of the lily pads, but sometimes the puzzle is figuring out where the hell you need to go to cannonball into the lily pads. Uh, there, there's another one. There's a, there's like a circle of a lot of circles of rocks in this game. There's a circle of rocks in the water, and you have to chuck a rock like basketball. You have to chuck a rock into the circle of rocks. Well, sometimes you have to figure out where the hell you need to go to chuck that rock. Uh, there's one where Uh, I had to use the, the little ice blocks to create a path to slide the rock across the top of the ice blocks and plop into the uh, um, the circle of rocks. You know, so I mean, you do have to. There does it. Some of them do take some thought. Uh, so the even though you've seen the puzzle a hundred times, well, not a hundred times, but a couple dozen times, um, the approach can be different each time. So that's good. I mean, the shooting gallery. I have no idea how many times the shooting galleries show up because I haven't counted them, but uh, the balloons or the nuts or whatever you're shooting at are in different orientations and different movement patterns each time. So it's a little different each time. I mean, it's not the same shooting gallery over and over, but every time you see a stump with a pinwheel on it, you're like, oh, that's the, that's the shooting gallery. Okay. Uh, let's see. Dee, 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 dee. Oh yeah, chaos said right right under that. You don't need anywhere near all nine hundred to max the inventory. Uh, considering the condition Link was at at the start of the game, his stamina is where it should be. He had been mostly dead for a hundred years. Um, yeah, I I mean it makes sense for a realistic standpoint. I mean it makes sense that your horse your horse takes a minute to get to you. That makes sense. That that logically follows. But I don't care because it's a video game. I don't care that it doesn't make sense that Link, um, you know, pops up from a hundred years slumber and has an eight second sprint, you know, like he started out with in the previous Zelda game. Granted that Link did not wake up from a hundred year slumber. He woke up from a, a, pleasant eight hour of sleep um but yeah I, again uh, me i will take functionality and gameplay over realism every time there's a lot in this game that is not realistic at all and doesn't bother me any it's a video game uh let's see how many sheer cliffs can you climb andrew me zero that's another thing in this game that ain't real, you know, Link's Spider-Man like ability to cling to every surface except the surfaces he can't, which appear to be mostly just the inside of any structure. So the inside of shrines, the inside of buildings, the inside of caves, he cannot climb for reasons, whatever the reason. I if you could climb surfaces, it would it would break the shrines, most of the shrines. Um but uh, yeah, so Link's better at climbing than I am. And as slow as he climbs, he climbs a lot faster than any one. I, I mean, that, that's, that's a unrealistically fast climbing speed. But again, I don't care because it's a video game. I don't want it to be absolutely realistic because it would be boring. <laughs> it would be really frustrating as hell to play. Oh, the ancient saddles from the DLC. Oh. Well, shit. <laughs> well, I guess I'm not getting the ancient saddle then. You know, I, I want the uh, the motorcycle too, um, but that's DLC, so I, I can't have the motorcycle. I have not reached Rito Village. You're correct. I have been to Kakariko Village. I have been to Hateno Village, and that's it. The, the, that's the sum. Uh, those are the only two villages I've been to. Uh, let's see. Uh, Link seems to be power trained and not stamina trained. Hmm, sure. Um, yeah, everyone tells me to get R R Rivali's Gale from the Divine Beast in the Rito Village. It will make climbing so much easier. I'm, 
I, I don't know what that does, but I'm I'm guessing it creates a whirlwind that shoots you up in the air. Oh, the motorcycle's hard to get, so you have to pay for it and then work for it. Huh? Okay. Um. Oh, uh, O Contextual. Uh, says video games that are too realistic are quite boring. I mean, I wouldn't want to play a game where I would need to get a license to carry around a weapon as an assault. Yeah, you can go overboard. Th that's not to say that simulations are don't have their place because they absolutely do. I I'm trying to think if there are any simulation games that I really like. Um, nothing comes to mind. Uh, but I mean, you have you know Sim City. Uh, and variations on that genre, some more granular in the specific realistic details than others. Um, so I, I, Sims have their place, but uh, so Breath of the Wild, it doesn't, it, it's weird, it, it doesn't strike me that Nintendo decided that Link should have a four second sprint at the beginning of the game just because, well, that only makes sense because of his 100 year nap. I seriously doubt that was the reasoning. Nintendo doesn't seem to care about stuff like that at all. One of the things I thought about uh, mentioning in my video series, but I'm not going to, but I'll mention it here, is the story. The story of Breath of the Wild so far is weird to me because, and I'm not criti I'm not criticizing it. I'm just observing what the story is so far, and and it could redeem itself later once I know more of the story. But from what I've seen so far, the story seems to be Link failed a hundred years ago and Zelda saved everything by locking Ganon in the castle because Link just flat out failed. Had the four divine beasts, had the four champions, had the armies, had the guardians, had everything, had the, had the sword and stuff and just failed. He failed. Nearly died. Zelda locked Ganon in a castle, and so now Link wakes up a hundred years later and is going to try and do the exact same thing. That seems like a bad plan. But I'm not going to fail this time! Why do you think it's going to go any different this time? Now, I don't know if that is literally what the story is. There's there's got to be more to it than that. Again, I have not played that much of the game, but that, that's that been my impression of the story so far. I'm thinking, yeah, what makes you think he's going to win this time? He's got even... You don't have the army or the guardians this time. Although I guess technically the guardians were overtaken, and that's one of the reasons. So I guess that that's a wash, because the, the guardians are ultimately against you in both uh, instances. But it's like, oh, we need to get the four divine beasts. And uh, although I know some speedrunners can just hon hop on over to uh, Hyrule Castle and beat Ganon with a tree branch. <laughs> so um, who knows? But it just seems kind of an odd story. It's like, oh, we'll get them this time by doing the exact same thing. Eh. Uh, rock band Guitar Hero singing as a simulacre. Well, that's an interesting point. I've played Guitar Hero 3. Uh, I like Guitar Hero 3. Um, I probably would not like, what is it, Rocksmith? Because that's that, I think, uses a, like a real guitar. Rock Band, or uh, rather, Guitar Hero 3 would not be fun for me with a real guitar because I don't play guitar. It, it works because it's a video game. Uh, the more realistic you get with it, the less fun it is for people who don't play guitar. Now, uh, stuff like, not rock band, uh, rock, whatever the one with the real guitar is, that definitely has its place. I mean, th there, there's one uh, that used a, uh, a keyboard, and I'm like, I can play the piano, I'll do that. But it uses a notation scheme that is not what I'm used to reading, so it's really hard for me. You know, the, the, the note highway things. I can't play to that. Just 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 print the sheet music and I'll sight read that. I can't read the note highway. That's not how music works. Um, it, I've always thought it's really odd when... Now, Guitar Hero does not use uh, guitar chord tablature. It, it doesn't use what you would see in a normal guitar chord chart. 
it uses the note highway because it's not a real guitar. It's a video game controller with silly buttons, with colorful plastic buttons. Um, <clears throat> but the Rock Band keyboard is a like a two octave keyboard or maybe it's a one octave I, I, I forget how wide it is but it's just a keyboard it's a it's a it's a it's a keyboard so why are you using the note highway when you actually have the actual instrument it would be like that rocksmith game that uses a real guitar actually used a note highway i don't know if it does maybe it does and that strikes me as a bad idea which is always and again, karaoke games I don't know why they don't use regular music notation. I don't know why they make up this weird notation scheme that doesn't mean anything to actual singers. So I can't sing karaoke because I have no idea what those notes are. You know, it jumps from here to here. What is that interval? Is it a third? A fifth? An octave? I don't know. I mean, I... It's usually up as higher and down. I mean, everyone I've seen is up as higher and down as lower, but by how much? A lot of them don't even uh, write where the where the measure lines are. So I have no idea where the beat. I find it eventually, but I have no idea where the beat is initially. Uh, the notes a lot of times don't have any indication of how long it should be held. It's so frustrating. So I think. If you are using a real instrument, whether it be a guitar, a keyboard, your voice, the notation should be real notation. But if you're using a funny plastic con controller with colorful buttons, then go ahead and make up your own uh, way to notate it so that it's easier to, to play on your video game controller. And for anyone who says, well, for people who aren't singers, they can't read music, or they they can't read the uh, they can't sight read sheet music, so that wouldn't help them. They can't sight read the made up notation either, so that doesn't help them. So you may as well make someone happy, and that someone should be me. <laughs> so uh, let's see, where are we? Um, Oh, uh, let's see. Oh, can Seal says, didn't mean to offend or anything. If people like realism, all oh, I don't think anyone took it like that. But uh, anyway, he says all the power to them. I just like my fantasy and heroism. Yeah, uh, for video, for me, video games are an escape. Uh, they're do things that I can't do in real life, uh, like climb up a sheer wall, swing a Spider Man, fly, you know that that kind of thing. Um, it's probably one of the reasons I don't typically have an interest in things like sports games, like uh, football or or the other football uh, or basketball. It's like I could, you know, I could go play basketball, I guess. I mean, you'd have to get other people and who wants to do that. But with those games, you know, the fantasy is playing in the NFL or the NBA or the whatever the other organizations are. Uh, so that makes sense. But uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm more of a fantasy person. I, I, I want, I want, I get, I, I've got enough realism in my life. Thank you. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm with Ocontexial. Um, there's definitely room for fantasy and there's definitely room for uh, simulation and everything on that gradient in between the two. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. D -d 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 -d. Uh, more like Zelda failed and Link died because of it. That's not what I've got out of the story so far. I, but then again, you get the story in pieces, and the order you get those pieces depends on where you happen to be on the map. And the story and the pieces I've looked at in the order I've seen them suggest that Link failed and Zelda saved everyone by locking Ganon in a castle for 100 years. But again, I've only seen two of the 12 memories. I think it's 12. Um, but one of the memories was pretty funny because she tries to make Link eat a frog. <laughs> eat it! <laughs> He's like, oh god, no! Um, yes, Link failed. No, he didn't have divine beasts. Well, he didn't, but the, the champions did, didn't they? At least that again, that's what I was getting out of what I've seen so far. So, 
uh, you, yeah, and you can beat Ganon without the Divine Beast. Um, uh, oh, right. See, that's that's an interesting perspective. Link wasn't expecting the betrayal. That's what caused him to fail. That's a good point. It's like, well, we're expecting the betrayal, or the or the or, you know. We were like, ah, we've got the Guardians, we've got the Champions, and the Divine Beast, and the Master Sword, and Zelda, and Link, and everything's gravy, and oh, shoot, we're dead. Well, now we know. So we're not going to be caught off guard this time. That, I like that. That's a good point. I'm, that's that's my headcanon for now. So it's not as stupid as I thought. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Link always wins, even if he fails. He is, after all, the hero of the goddesses of Hyrule, or something. Uh, my Zelda lore is quite rusty, but Link never fails, obviously. Yeah. Let's talk about the Zelda timeline, because this is the dumbest thing uh, ever. Um, you see, I know there's a there's the 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 book, so it's it's official and canon now. But I don't care. You see, to me, there is no Zelda timeline. It's the legend of Zelda. So there's a bunch of different stories. Each game is just a different legend, or even a retelling of the same legend. It's like, oh, he had the Ocarina of Time, and he did the thing, and he would... Yeah, it's like, oh, really? Well... Well, I heard he was on this floating island in the sky, and they were rode little birds, and and had this really annoying computer purple person who was, you know, but but she could dance good, you know. That's how Zelda has always been to me, the legend of Zelda. So when Nintendo years back came out with here's the official timeline, I was like, oh no, no, don't do that. And you can tell it's stupid because they had to split it into like three alternate realities. <laughs> Now, games that are specifically sequels of another, like uh, Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask, yeah, one takes place after the other. Uh, but for the most part, I've always looked at the series as just the legend of Zelda, and they're, they're just different tellings of the legend, which is why you have different characters in different places and different things every time, because it depends on who's telling it and when. Um, I mean, it's kind of like the idea of Santa Claus, right? I mean, you go to different places in the world and you have different versions of the same character. You know? It, I mean, you could do an Avengers-style team-up movie of uh, Santa Claus teaming up with Saint Nick, teaming up with the Krampus, teaming up with, you know, all the other versions. of That would actually probably be pretty cool. But no one looks at it that way no one thinks that uh, santa and saint nick and krampus and all all exist in the same universe it's all variations on a theme santa is saint nick is krampus is whatever the the others are that's how i've always looked at it now again if you really like the timeline it, that's great because that stuff is dorky and a lot of fun uh but me i've always looked at it as just a legend which is why I've never cared about the continuity between the series. It's like, well, in that game, he, who cares? <laughs> you know. Uh, let's see. Uh, dee, 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 where are we? Uh, I would have preferred that you played the content in the flashbacks rather than just watch them. Hey. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, again, I've only seen like two, and they've both been really, really talky. So. Um, but yeah, it can be frustrating to watch a cutscene and be like, dude, this is a game. Can I play that? It's a nice movie, really, it is, but I'd like to play it, being that I paid you know, $50, $60 or whatever. Uh, he killed something like 80% of the Guardians the first time? So close. So close. <laughs> um, ah, Chaos, uh, the whole point of Rocksmith is to teach you to play. That, that's true. That's right. Uh, so it's, it's a different focus for that game. Um, de -de 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 -de. helps if you already know the song. Are you talking about karaoke? Yeah, I don't know any songs, so it doesn't help. But I can sight read. But that doesn't help me with karaoke because they don't use proper music notation. Just seeing the lyrics doesn't help because I don't know what the melody is. Sometimes I might know the chorus and maybe part of the verse, but 
you know, once once you get to the verse, I'm like, I, uh, I don't know. And pop music these days has like two, maybe three chords, so there's not a whole hell of a. So you you can only ear sing so much. It's like I'm I'm just gonna sing on route for the entire for the entire thing and until a chord forces me off of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, you like um, Ocon Ocon Textile likes how I pronounce the dumb username YouTube username made up in high school. <laughs> uh, let's see. Matthew says continue. She failed to master her powers until after Link is hurt. Okay. Uh, Laxter Link doesn't fail. He just takes a break for a hundred years. Yeah, get cut the guy some slack. He's he was tired. Um, that sword is heavy. Uh, let's see. Um. Uh, Leaf says Hyrule Historia has been retconned now. Yeah, I think uh, they modified something to it a while back, and th they're just going to have to keep releasing a new book every single game. Uh, a couple games have changed places. Um, oh, they 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 made Majora's Mask into a dream. I don't like that. <laughs> You know the, the fanboy in me that that kind of rubs me the wrong way. There, there's to, to me there there are a few things worse than a denouement, denouement, denouement. How's that word pronounced? Um, than an ending of a like a story, a movie, or whatever. When the character wakes up and it was all a dream. I hate that. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Legend of Zelda. And, uh... Sorry, I'm reading the chat. Uh, would I be able to do the vocals on Beatles Rock Band? Um, another problem with uh, me performing karaoke is I have a deeper voice, uh, which means I generally can't sing high enough to comfortably sing the melody to most songs, which is really frustrating because I like singing, but... It's why I like barbershop because I can sing the harmony part, the, the low harmony part, and be fine for the most part. Um, but I can't really sing along with the radio because unless I double it or sing a harmony a harmony part, because it's it's usually too high. Now there are some songs that I I can sing. I can sing. Well, I can sing part of like uh, Josh Turner, who's a country singer with a with a deep voice. Uh, but the guy can also sing a lot higher than I can. So I can, uh, would you go with me? It, you know, do do that song. But then he uh, gets up into the... You know, it goes way up there. And it's, I'm like, oh, I don't have it. Um, I can, you know, so I can sing maybe some Johnny Cash... Some um, uh, Tennessee Ernie Ford, you know, like sixteen tons. Uh, I can. Uh, th there are some uh, songs that have a bass melody, like um, like sixteen tons and um, Brother, can you spare a dime? Uh, if you've ever heard heard that one. Um, uh, oh yeah, they used to tell me I was building a dream. And so I followed the mob. I followed the mob where there was earth, a plow, or guns to bear. I was always the, you know, that's in a comfortable range for me, at least most of the song. Um, oh, there's another good barbershop song, uh, uh, arrangement of Mary, Did You Know? Uh, that's usually the, a bass melody. You know, mm -hmm. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Mary, did you? Um, the only problem with that song is it gets really high. So there's some arrangements where um, uh, the, the melody switches off to the lead. And there are other arrangements where the bass takes the melody all the way. And I think it goes as high, depending on what key you sing it in. Some of them have gone as high as like F uh, above middle C. And... I, it amazes me that I, that I hear uh, when I hear bass singers that uh, that can sing so comfortably up above middle C, and I can't. It's I'm like, oh, that's not fair. 
that's not fair at all. <laughs> you know. Anyway, uh, look up uh, who who's a good performer. Uh, Gas House Gang. Look up uh, Mary. Did you know Gas House Gang? Um, there's got to be a performance of them doing that on YouTube somewhere. Great song. Uh, really cool tenor part too. Actually, they they do a great arrangement of Sixteen Tons. Uh, come to think of it. Uh, what's the bass's name? Uh, Henry John? Uh, forget his name. Anyway, uh, let's see. Do, do, do. Uh, da, 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 da. Where are we? Uh, Chaos says, figures you would be more likely to know those songs. Well, I'm a, I'm a barber shopper, so a lot of the songs I know are, are fairly old. Um, like, um, let me think of a good one, like uh, uh, Blue Skies. Uh, I can't remember the, I, yeah, the the problem is it's like I'll sing the song for you to, to try and to see if you know the song but it's like I don't know what the melody is it, it, it's hard singing a song at someone and singing the harmony part because it sounds really weird to other people um, um, blue skies shine, that's smiling at me nothing but blue skies do I see Blue bird singing a song, blue birds all day long. Yeah, you know, that song, that's an old song. It's a great song, but yeah, it's old. <laughs> it's it's probably not something you're gonna hear on pop stations these days. Uh it's a there's a great barbershop arrangement of that too. Uh let's see. Uh, dee, 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 dee. Uh, Contextual says, uh, I feel the karaoke with Andrew should be a thing, and I've only been here for like two streams. Um, well, it, one of the funny things I, I, I like to do is I have a uh, pitch pipe, uh, which is, uh, if you don't know what that is, it's a, it's this thing, and it has a, uh, I hope this, let me, <laughs> yeah, so you, uh, when you're starting to sing, you, uh, unless you have perfect pitch, which I do not. I have relative pitch. Um, you'd be like... Um... Mm -hmm. Give me your hand to hold in mine, and I will give you my heart, my heart, you know, uh, to get you a start. You know how when you're in restaurants or the work workplace and it's somebody's birthday and... They're like, oh, we're everybody gather around. We're going to sing you happy birthday. And people start singing in like seven different keys. That's why I like having a pitch pipe with me because they're like, okay, everyone, we're going to sing a birthday. And they, ha, 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 ha. You know, they have a bunch of happy birthday and I'll take out my pitch pipe. And I'll be like, <laughs> <laughs> I'll just, I'll blow at their faces. They're like, what? I'll <laughs> blow insistently at them. And it's it's really funny. Uh, some people who can't match pitch, and I don't mean to make fun of them, but, but you know, some people can. Bop. Some people can hear a pitch and match it. Some people. But it just it 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 doesn't make sense to them, and um, it is it can be funny, but try not to you know humiliate anyone doing that. You know light teasing of people you already know is fine but you know not nice to pick on the tone deaf um oh I, i'm sorry chaos back to beatles uh i actually know a lot of beatles music i can't really sing the melody to a lot of it, it it's it's just a little high um i know actually there's a really oh man who was it masters of harmony or someone who did a really great uh medley of uh beatles songs um so uh and i i like and i actually recognized a lot of the songs uh Be beatles are good you know penny lane ticket to ride uh hey jude lots of lots of beatles stuff so uh, the question is Beatles or Elvis? And I've always wondered why is it Beatles or Elvis? <laughs> why not both? Um, I like a fair number of Elvis's songs. I actually wrote an arrangement of uh, Don't, which I guess is probably one of his uh, lesser known songs. Um, uh, it, don't, don't. 
uh, leave me this way because here in my arms you should stay <laughs> you know it's something like that uh, it's, it's a great little song and, and i thought it made a pretty good barbershop arrangement um uh with a deep voice as yours you might be great at singing elvis songs lol um well i i can sing the bass part of the song that i wrote or, or the song that i arranged don't um but uh let me let me think. I think uh, "Don't" is the original's like in B flat or C somewhere around there because it, it's just Elvis saying, say, "Don't, don't, da 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 ba 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 ba." You know, it, it's that range somewhere around there. Um, but when I wrote it for Barbershop, or, or I'm sorry, when I arranged it for Barbershop, I kicked that thing up into F. Um, so, uh, I mean, so instead of, uh, being a, a, a bass lead, it's a, it's a, a lead lead. <laughs> so don't, don't, that's what you say each time that is something that I, you know, that the lead part is way up and up there. Um, but I don't sing lead, so I don't have to worry about it. So uh, I wrote it as a, or arranged it as an echo. So you have, don't, 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 da 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 da. You know, have a bass echo to the melody. It, it's good. You'll have to trust me. It's pretty good. <laughs> You'll never hear it because no one's ever recorded it. But just imagine that I wrote that I arranged something that was really good and. That and that's what it sounds like. So there. Uh, ooh, Beatles or Stones? You prefer the Stones, says Chaos. Um, huh, man, that, that that's hard to compare because that's different eras. I. Hmm. That's tough, man. Uh, Beatles or Stones? Wow. I don't. I. I. You know, honestly, I don't know how to compare the two. Uh, they're they're just so different. I I, I like them both, but uh, I would say that I could probably sing a lot more of the Beatles catalog than I could from the stones. Uh, I, I mean, not, you know, sing well, but I mean, just out of, uh, off the top of my head out of memory, but, um, there you go. So, uh, Otraitsu says, sounds like something you'd have to hear in person. Either way, recordings lose something in translation. That's true. Especially in recordings these days where there's a lot of, uh, digital, futzing around and i don't just mean auto-tune i mean you know adding echoes and reverb and bass and things like that um which is something that as an acapella singer someone who's uh who does live shows in front of audiences uh using just our voices it's always something that's that, that's never sat right with me now i don't mind auto-tune and things like that as a tool to uh, add a desired effect. That's fine. Uh, I don't mind it being used uh, to help your pitchiness if you're creating a learning tape, uh, because a lot of times when we create learning tapes, we're we're singing all four parts, and there are very few people who can comfortably cleanly sing all four parts. If you can, you've got one hell of a range on you. You're probably like Tim Warwick or something, um, <clears throat> who I know and have sung with. And you probably don't know who that is. That probably means nothing to you. I know lots of gold medalist uh, um, uh, barber shoppers. I, I'm one of them, so I guess that makes sense. Uh, but I'm a chorus gold medalist. I'm not a quartet uh, gold medalist. The, the, the highest I've gone uh, in quartet is top 10 district, which uh, is uh, my district is far west, which is... Uh, uh, California, Arizona. Well, actually, I think it's uh, 
Southern California, Arizona, and at least part of Nevada. But it's a very competitive dif- district, so uh, I was pretty pleased that uh, my quartet got top ten uh, in in district back in twenty eleven, something like that. So. Uh, what would I consider my favorite musical artists? Um, Weird Al Yankovic. I like the comedy peoples. Um, someone else, I, I it's Weird Al is the only one I actually buy cassettes and then CDs for, and um, because I, I just. What's interesting is I normally will, a lot of times I'll hear the Weird Al parody before I'll hear the original song. So I'll be in the gym or something and I'll hear a song and be like, that's that song Al parodied. Um, but I also like uh, uh, Tom Lehrer, who's uh, an, an, an old, uh, an, another singing comedian kind of guy. Um, I could probably name like barbershop quartets, but... Uh, Chaos says, intro into Gimme Shelter is a musical perfection. Jeff Lynn, okay. Gimme Shelter is not ringing a bell, though. Uh, favorite musical artists? Uh, yeah, Weird Al. That's definitely my favorite. Uh, but I have a lot of respect for, uh, you know, a, a lot of uh, a lot of artists from uh, uh, classics like, um, oh, I don't know, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, Elvis, Beatles, uh, Patsy Cline, uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire, uh, Three Dog Night, alike. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going old here. Uh, um, I like I, li- I like a lot of the uh, '50s, '60s era stuff. I like uh, uh, Diamonds, Platters, uh, um, Aretha Franklin. I'd uh, love her stuff. Um, uh, like like some of the the older uh, big band stuff. Uh, uh, Cab Calloway. Uh, so I, I have pretty broad eclectic taste. Uh, I, I'm not much of a music collector though. I, I don't have a lot of. Uh, uh, I you know I also like a film score. Uh, so I, I've always been a big fan of. Uh, Danny Elfman and of course uh, uh, John Williams. Those are probably my uh, my two favorite uh, uh, film uh, composers. So, uh, contextual says only been here for two streams. I've already managed to make the streamer feel old. God, I love myself. <laughs> yeah, I'm thirty eight. I had to think about that for a second. Thirty eight. I'll be thirty nine in February. So uh, yeah, I'm I'm approaching midlife, and, and unless I get, unless my ultimate fate is to be hit by a truck at some point in the future, and then then I'm well past midlife. But uh, you just never know. So uh, what else have been gone? I was, was going to talk about more games and uh, movie trailers because uh, uh, the the end of the Spider Verse trailer came out this week. Um, or a, a new trailer for it. And I was already going to see it because it's a cartoon and it's Spider-Man. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, uh, you, got, you got me already. But uh, yeah, this one definitely sealed the deal. Uh, I'm, they showed off a lot more of the spider peoples. Uh, in addition to Peter Parker and Miles Morales, you've got uh, Gwen Stacy, Spider-Gwen, Sp- Gwen Stacy. Um, you've got... Um, Peter Porker, the 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 Spider Ham, the 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 Pig Spider Man. Uh, you've got uh, Spider Man Noir. Um, you have, uh, I think it's Penny Parker, except her style is like way different than I'm familiar with. I I, I don't. I, I'm not terribly familiar with that character, but that's the only person I I can think of that that would be. Um. Well, it's got to be her because they showed the robot, the the spider or wh- whatever that mech's name is. Uh, so that's got to be her. But she's drawn in a really, um, really manga style, which is interesting. 
Um, and I love the fact that each of the characters are drawn in a, uh, a in a different style. Even the the Spider Man Noir is uh, the character is black and white, but if you look closely, it has the um, I forget what the technique is, but but the uh, the white and black dot patterns to do the the, the gradients to get different shades of gray. Um, the uh, the spider ham is uh, is uh, much more cell shaded. Uh, Penny is looks like she's stepped literally out of a manga comic. Uh, I'm really liking that aspect, so that looks really cool. Um, Tritsu says I'm not the only one, probably referring to being old. Uh, Chaos will be 37 next week, um, and Tritsu's a handful of years younger. Well, I'm. <clears throat> Uh, Zachary, I think, is a year behind me, if I'm remem remembering right. I think he's 37. Or maybe he just turned 38 at his last birthday. Eh, something like that. We're getting old, folks. But this is for video games, our age is a pretty good age to be because we're old enough to have been around for most of the most of the gaming industry. I mean, it, it does predate us a bit with uh, a lot of the stuff in the seventies, like the, you know, the, the Magnavox and, and things like that. But, um, uh, for my money, I, I guess maybe I'm, I'm biased because I was born in 1980. So for me, it started with the Atari, uh, 2600 and geez, what 83 or something like that. Um, so not exactly the beginning, as I said. The you know the Magnavox was late seventies, and they they had the Pong console and a few others. Um, so I I kind of missed those, but that's that's pretty near the beginning. That, that that's that's seeing almost all of it, and uh, at the very least, if you were born in eighty to eighty three or four or somewhere around there, uh, it doesn't take a whole hell of a lot of research to catch up on every video game thing that happened for them because there just wasn't that much of it i mean video game consoles before the atari 2600 were pretty much a console that played one game <laughs> you know so uh, so uh oh it's 8 30 look at that so i guess we'll we'll call it a night uh hope you enjoyed my ramblings uh and thanks for uh Thanks for uh, thanks for keeping me company for the evening, and I hope you're all doing groovy. So uh, take care. Of, oh well, I guess let me plug my stuff. Andrew Eisen, E I S E N, is how you spell the last name. Plug it into YouTube. You'll find my YouTube videos, uh, which is mostly the podcast right now because I've been extraordinarily busy with uh, life, man, life. But I'm working on a series of YouTube videos that hopefully I'll have at the end of the month. Uh, doing the charity stream again. That's November 3rd. Uh, lots of cool stuff, uh, donation incentives and stretch goals and all kinds of fun things. So go to extra-life.org slash participant slash Andrew Eisen or just go to extra-life.org and type Andrew Eisen and you'll find my page. Uh, donations are tax deductible. All the money goes to Rady Children's Hospital. Uh, so it's a good cause, a lot of fun. Hope you'll support me on that. And uh, that's it for me. We'll see you back here next week for more Molehill Mountain. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.